So you can see Natalie on the screen there. She's based <laughs> in North at Massey and is doing her PhD there. Um, and Juliana, you're one of the supervisors, is that right? I am. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, and Natalie's doing her PhD on uh, the topic of contesting refugeeness or constructing refugeeness, exploring mediated discourses of hospitality, welcome and refugee self-representation in New Zealand, and we'll be presenting on one of those aspects today. Okay, so Natalie, <laughs> over to you, please. Okay, all right, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, it's great to see you all. Um, so just to give you a brief overview, make sure that works. Can everyone hear me okay? Just to check. Yeah, okay, great. Um, and so I'm just going to give a brief outline of my research and my methodology before going into some background information about refugee representation, sort of normative representations. Um, and then go into my media findings, um, just a little bit of context before actually concentrating mostly on some of the interviews I had with former refugees here in New Zealand. Okay, so and I'm sure all of you are aware the world's currently facing the biggest refugee crisis since World War II, um, with unprecedented numbers of people forcefully displaced and on the move. As a result, many countries around the world are facing huge challenges in how to manage and welcome those in need, um, while others are choosing to close their borders um, and restrict access to asylum procedures altogether. Media coverage of the refugee crisis in 2015 and 2016 um, was largely dominated by images of desperate people arriving in boats to Europe, scrambling over barbed wire fences and trekking en masse through the European countryside. While a lot of the coverage was sympathetic to the plight of these refugees, there wasn't a lot of momentum for action in terms of an EU-wide humanitarian response. There was, however, a prevalence of myth and misinformation about refugees, um, which only served to fuel fear and xenophobia and added to rising populist nationalist rhetoric. But then in September 2015, something quite extraordinary happened um, that transformed the global response to the refugee crisis. As the Wall Street Journal reported, once in a while, an image breaks through the noisy, cluttered global culture and hits people in the heart and not the head. That image was the tragic photo of drowned toddler Alan Kurdi, washed up on a beach in Turkey after the boat um, that he and his family were in capsized trying to reach Europe. Although thousands of refugees had already lost their lives trying to cross the Mediterranean in search of safety, Alan's photo evoked feelings of outrage and sadness, becoming the defining image of the so-called European refugee crisis. Unlike other photos of the crisis, Alan's photo created a groundswell of support around the world for those seeking refuge. <coughs> Here in New Zealand, a media debate emerged about what more New Zealand could or should do in light of this refugee crisis. Refugee advocates and media commentators across the political divide called on the national government at the time to increase the refugee quota and show a stronger, more compassionate response to those seeking refuge. Although I welcome this debate and I personally um, also support the raising of the refugee quota, I began to question how the refugee crisis was being reported here and how refugees were being represented within that argument for raising the quota. I also wondered what these media commentaries could possibly say about the welcoming and wider perception of refugees here in New Zealand. So, with that in mind, um, my presentation today forms part of my PhD research, as Jess said, um, which explores those refugee representations in New Zealand in the mainstream media. Um, and I'm focusing around the height of the Syrian or so called European refugee crisis in 2015, um, particularly. Uh, in September 2015, after the reaction um, to Alan's photo. I wanted to know what these representations may say about New Zealand's response to the refugee quota. But I also wanted to know how do people from refugee backgrounds think of that word refugee, and in what ways were they trying to contest, negotiate, and transform those discourses, if at all, um, in order to create space for the construction of their own identities in the process. Um, so, 
What I did is I examined 70 online news articles, which included straight news pieces, editorials, and opinion pieces from the New Zealand Herald and Stuff websites. Um, and as, as I said, during the month of 2015 to coincide with the public reaction to Alan's photo. I also conducted in-depth interviews with eight refugee advocates um, and 18 in-depth interviews with people from refugee backgrounds, which included um, a mixture of men and women, people of different ages, um, people who had been in New Zealand for various lengths of time, um, and different countries of origin as well. Um, so I will go uh, briefly touch on the media findings, um, so you can just give a bit of a context about how refugees were represented here um, within that media argument, um, before mainly focusing on um, my interviews. They illustrate um, the thoughts and opinions on refugee representation from people from refugee backgrounds. And so within this research, I am focusing mainly on the humanitarian representations of refugees, but I thought it, it might be helpful for those who, who don't know um, the, the way that refugees are normally being represented in the media, and there's this binary um, that happens. So um, the media representations, normative media representations, I should say, um, sit within these really complex discourses of security um, and hospitality or humanitarianism, um, with refugees predominantly framed as either helpless victims or objects of fear. Um, effectively creating this binary between good and bad, genuine and bogus, deserving and undeserving refugees. And so discourses of securitisation feed off this politics of fear, positioning, positioning refugees and asylum seekers as a threat to national security and Western ways of life, whatever that might mean. Um, asylum seekers are routinely portrayed as illegal migrants or bogus refugees, trying to jump the queue or exploit the system. The use of inflammatory headlines, coupled with particular kinds of photographs and metaphors of natural disasters, reiterates and recycles negative stereotypes, giving the impression that the receiving country is in danger of being overrun, swamped, invaded by dangerous outsiders. Also what happens is the terms refugee, asylum seeker and migrant become conflated and used interchangeably, which adds to the blurring of the lines between who is perceived to be a genuine, thus deserving of protection, and who is not. These kinds of discourses don't take into account the complex socio-political push factors that force people to flee across borders, um, nor does it con convey the individual experiences of seeking asylum. Um, and if from, my, from what I've read in the literature, really these discourses only expound those xenophobic views um, and minimise the legal, moral and humanitarian obligations of states. In contrast, humanitarian discourses, um, so discourses of solidarity, hospitality, welcome, um, are situated within the humanitarian discourses. Um, these discourses stem from humanitarian concern and an ethical and moral duty towards helping refugees but they can also feed into discourses of national identity and imagining of humanitarian values. They also risk encouraging a regime of compassion and charity that speaks more about our moral responsibility and how we should respond. And when I say we, I'm talking about Western audiences or Western publics. Um, with, with advocacy groups, um, often speaking on behalf of refugees and asylum seekers, thus turning refugees into objects of our moral responsibility. So the problem with these humanitarian discourses is they also involve complex relations of politics, power and ethics. Who is visible, who is not? <coughs> who gets to speak over others? Who gets interviewed and quoted um, in articles and who doesn't? Refugees are largely absent from these discourses. They're also absent from decision making and policy discussions at NGO and government level and also from recent advocacy initiatives. What voice they do have is often mediated in a way that obscures their history, identity and agency, reducing them to a soundbite or a side piece to a larger story. Often it is assumed that refugees are too vulnerable to speak for themselves or lack the power and capabilities or capacity to do so. Recent advocates may also be seen as the more authoritative figure to seek comment about a particular situation. 
Some stereotypes of refugees as helpless victims feeds into the humanitarian imaginations of Western publics, which um, in turn fail to address the root causes of forced displacement and again ignores the multiple experiences of those being represented. So where do the New Zealand media sit within these discourses? Oh, sorry, missed that slide. <laughs> Um, so media findings strongly revealed an overwhelming ethical and moral argument for raising um, the refugee quota that drew on a particular narrative of New Zealand identity and nationhood, that is, New Zealand as a warm, welcoming, compassionate country. As this quote here highlights, it's an emotive argument that focuses on the decency and kindness of New Zealanders and our responsibilities as a humanitarian actor and as a good global citizen. We can't stand by and watch such incredible suffering while we only accept a paltry 750 people a year in our refugee um, intake. How Kiwis react to desperate people fleeing terror on the other side of the world is about who we are as people. So these ethical and moral arguments used by the media plan what Matthew Gibney refers to as an ethics of hospitality or a form of unconditional hospitality, that is the humanitarian principle or duty to assist those who are suffering and in need. This is a moral principle between strangers who share nothing more than a common humanity. Helping vulnerable suffering others is also about our identity as a humanitarian nation. Catherine de Verne argues that humanitarianism is about identity, not so much about the identity of the person in need of help, but um, more so about how helping the other reflects back on us. Humanitarian then serves as a way to define a nation as compassionate and caring. By helping others, we are effectively giving ourselves a pat on the back, or as Kakur describes, a form of narcissistic Samaritanism, which is politely harsh, but can be slightly true as well. So by representing refugees as vulnerable victims who deserve our help, the media in its own way contributes to the imagining of New Zealand as a compassionate and welcoming country. And within these arguments of raising the refugee quota, um, we, I found a lot of the stereotypical imaginings of refugees as these vulnerable victims. Uh, victims who are traumatised, distressed and in need of saving. So various media commentators, journalists and members of the public who were interviewed for uh, some of the news articles that I analysed, describe refugees caught up in the crisis as some of the, most, some of the world's most vulnerable people, distraught mothers holding their babies, people dying trying to flee their desperate and dead-end situations. They're also described as hopeless millions, doomed and despairing, and with nothing and nowhere to go, which is why New Zealand needed to raise the quota and do more to help. So the refugee here represents the hurt and vulnerable stranger whom the New Zealand government and society has a moral duty to assist. Jennifer Hyman speaks of this as a form of charitable humanity or a form of colonisation of compassion that purports to speak for others while at the same time silences refugee voices. So the humanitarian argument largely focused on New Zealand's moral duty to respond to the refugee crisis and within that, refugees were predominantly portrayed as vulnerable victims. But what I found most um, interesting, I guess, is that what was missing are the voices of those who had actually been refugees, who had gone through the experience of, of displacement and resettlement. You know, what did they think? The few articles that did interview people from refugee backgrounds within my catchment tended to focus on the trauma story um, of, of, of survival, you know, how they've been bombed on, they, how many dead people they had seen, the traumatic situations they had been through to seek safety. Which I think only serves to emphasise this victim stereotype and reiterates New Zealand's role as saviour. So many of the former refugees that I interviewed did feel that the mainstream media in New Zealand tended to simplify refugee stories, presenting a very one-dimensional representations of refugees as helpless brown folk from war-torn countries. Instead, um, another uh, one of my participants, Rahul, um, believed that the media only focused on that refugees run away from their country and they're vulnerable and they're weak 
and they need us and they need safety. But she said they don't try to get to know their culture, their traditions, who they are. And another of my participants, Sakina, felt that the media um, ended up dehumanising refugees through these stereotypes because they labelled them like objects. She described like some fiction characters in a film. So many of those that I interviewed um, felt that this, this uh, stereotype of the helpless refugee repeatedly reinforced this homogenous view of what a real refugee should look like. And the only image of a refugee the public gets to know is the one that's perpetuated by the media. Um, another person I interviewed, Abdul, um, believed that many former refugees don't want to be associated with that uh, refugee label because of those stereotypes and because people don't tend to look beyond the label. He, he explained to me, because if you think of refugee, the image that conjures up is someone quite poor and destitute and in a bad way, and you don't want to affiliate yourself with that. Unless you tell the full story and say, yeah, we were like that, but look at us now. And they use that as a source of strength, as a narrative. And what he's getting at here is that because the media only tends to focus on the traumatic side of the experience and they don't focus on anything else, you know, on, on where this person has come from, what they're doing now, what they've achieved here in New Zealand, because of that, people don't want to share these stories necessarily. But if the media did focus on the full story, then perhaps more people from refugee backgrounds would be willing to share their story because if they saw you know, the person from a refugee background is a full person with a full history, and then actually instead of seeing them as a traumatised person, seeing them as a survivor and someone who's very resilient, then people actually may be more likely to associate that with refugee. Um, so there was, there was agreement from uh, most of the people I spoke to that there actually needed to be a lot more stories in the media that told the full story of refugee and resettlement that focus on people's background skills, capabilities, and strengths. As another of my participants already explained, while there may be some similarities with every refugee story, by focusing on only one part of the story, i.e. the trauma story, you miss that richness of stories. So how do people that I spoke to see the word refugee? Did they identify with it at all? And in what ways were they contesting and redefining that word, if at all? Not every person I spoke to thought the word refugee um, was negative, and whether they chose to be associated with the refugee label or not really depended on how they saw the word in the first place. While some people I interviewed completely rejected the refugee label, others chose to embrace their refugee identity, um, and those people tended to associate the word with strength, resilience and power. Abdul, for example, although he didn't personally identify with the word refugee per se, he said that he associates refugee with hard working, the struggles, the strong will aspects of that word. Whereas another person, John, that I interviewed, he, um, he associated refugee with victimhood. For him, it was a very, very negative term and he didn't want anything to do with it at all. He said, he told me, he said, I don't define as a former vulnerable person, a former poor person, I actually define myself based on my quality as a person. That's how I define. And for him, I think this stems from a lot. He, he experienced a lot of discrimination, a lot of negativity um, when he first came to New Zealand. Um, and he, for him, he just didn't want anything to do with that word refugee. For him, it, it gave him nothing. It didn't benefit him in any way. And all he felt was negativity from it and the discrimination. I remind him, I think, of the discrimination that he came across when people found out that he was from a refugee background. But others were quite neutral about the word. Um, they neither identified with it nor felt it was really negative. Um, for Ibram, <coughs> he said, um, you know, I carry that nickname, he called it a nickname, um, quite a few years, so it's going to be with me, but I don't want to be identified as a refugee. So for him, it was... Yeah, this is part of my history, part of my life story. It's, it, it, you know, I can't get away from that. Um, I'm here in New Zealand because I was a refugee, but actually, you know, I've moved on, I've done other things. Um, you know, I don't necessarily identify with that word. Another person I spoke to, Joseph, he was really proud of his refugee identity because for him it represented the fact that he um, upheld his political beliefs 
and it and it for him associated with his resilience and survival of getting here to New Zealand. Um, he said, you know, I chose to be a refugee because I think there is no shame in it. This is my honour because I put my humanity first. And for Joseph, he, in his home country, he was politically persecuted. He was put in prison for his political beliefs. He was a, a human rights activist in this country of origin. Um, and he said that he could have stayed. Like Once he eventually got out of jail, he could have stayed. But he chose not to because he felt like he couldn't be himself. And so he chose to leave. He chose to become a refugee. And for him, that was him upholding his beliefs, so there's no shame in it. I just want to share another quote with you, which I thought was quite cute. These, these two people I interviewed, Beth and Thomas, they were about 16, 17. Um, they ran a, um, a refugee youth radio show on Saturdays down in Wellington. And um, for, him, for them, they like to refer to refugees as superheroes. Um, people who are courageous, brave, resilient, and have survived great hardship, and also are very resourceful. But Beth went, went on to say, you know, refugee doesn't mean feel sorry for me. It means I ran out of my country. I'm brave. I am looking for a new future. That's what a refugee is. Refugee means we can do it. And then they went on to describe also along that superhero line, that like Batman and Catwoman and Spider-Man and how they felt refugees were kind of like that, which I thought was a rather unique and interesting way of looking at it. But of all the people I interviewed, um, Sakina was felt the most comfortable with the word refugee. Um, she felt um, that she strongly identified with the refugee label um, as it formed a very important part of her story and why she was in New Zealand. She says it gave her a sense of purpose and who she is today because, because of that whole refugee experience. Um, I'll just go on to her quote so you can start reading that. Um, she said, when your family fled your homeland, um, Sakina believes they lost their identity and being granted refugee status gave them another identity. So she explains here, because we had forgotten everything, we were in such pain and stress to get somewhere. We had left our whole family behind. So thinking about it now, back then we actually felt like no one. So the word refugee did give us an identity. Since our passports and everything we had with us had drowned in the ocean, the word gave us a name. So for her, it was very, <clears throat> excuse me, it was very important to remember her past and to, and, and it was very much part of who she is today. But regardless, regardless of whether people chose to embrace or reject the refugee label, what became very apparent to me um, was the clear desire to take back control of the narrative that is created by the media and by other organisations and refugee advocates and to find themselves. In the process, they were challenging and transforming those dominant discourses and perceptions of refugees in their own way. And I just want to share an example of, of an organisation, a grassroots organisation in Auckland that's doing a lot of work about redefining um, the word refugee. The Auckland Resettled Community Coalition um, um, has set out to really change and define that, to find the narrative around refugee, um, and they themselves have gone through a name change. So they used to be called the Auckland Refugee Community Coalition, but they decided to swap out refugee with resettled um, because that's how they like to be seen. They also use the terms newcomers, new New Zealanders, um, settled, um, anything but refugee. So when I asked Aban, uh, the general manager of ARCC, what he thought about the way refugees were represented in the mainstream media, he said, you know, who gives them that authority or who gives them that right to describe other people? They know how to describe themselves. Doesn't mean that I need your help and you take my dignity. There's no human right there. Simple things can change a lot of meaning. So for me, they just need to get it right. And what he's talking about here is that words really matter. And so government agencies, resettlement providers, NGOs, refugee advocates, the media need to mind their language and use the correct terminology when referring to people from refugee backgrounds. Because continuing to refer to people as refugees once they had resettled here in New Zealand and were no longer refugees, takes away their dignity and their rights to define themselves. So Barn argued it was important to change that narrative and redefine the word refugee as it become associated with negative stereotypes, which in turn um, end up stigmatising 
people are making them feel like they're not part of New Zealand, that they don't belong here, that they're not accepted, that they will never be New Zealanders and will always be refugees. Um, so the ARC have run three campaigns um, or projects to, to help to redefine that word refugee, which includes a photo exhibition, a book about resettlement um, here in New Zealand or in Auckland specifically, and an art installation um, that highlighted the stories from the book. So I'll just show you some pictures. Um, so this is part some photos from um, the photo exhibition New Zealand is now from refugees to Kiwis. Um, and the, the aim of this exhibition was to raise awareness around the word refugee, to educate the public and change perceptions about refugees, and also illustrate the contributions that new New Zealanders are making to New Zealand. Um, and this was done very collaboratively. Um, so the photographer worked with the people who, were photo who had agreed to be photographed. Um, so they decided how they were going to be photographed. They also decided what kind of quotes that they wanted to be used next to their photo. So it was a very participatory exercise. The other project that they did was a self-published book on the stories of resettlement in Auckland um, from the perspective of former refugees. Uh, they then worked in partnership with a local artist to transform these stories into a public art installation called The Journey of a Million Miles Following Steps. The stories were pre-recorded and then played through up into growing boats. I'll just show you a photo here. Um, and members of the public were encouraged to lie down under the boats and listen to the stories of refuge and resettlement. Um, and this was part of the Waiheke Sculpture Trail, um, Waikiki Island Sculpture Trail back in 2017, I think it was. And where, where these boats were through, there was a series of these boats. And our position, with our position looking out over the Hauraki Gulf back towards Auckland was just it was really spectacular setting, but also very powerful in terms of listening to these stories, um, lying underneath these boats, and these beautiful sari material underneath the boats. And on the outside of the boats, they were covered in all these tiny little paper boats, which to me kind of looked like barnacles. Um, so that was a very nice, kind of um, powerful installation. Um, so Avanti to me that the reason why they did these projects, it was not just about um, you know, redefining the word refugee, but it was also about doing things differently and taking control of the message um, to contest and transform those, those stereotypes. Um, he said in a way that we wanted to do, how we wanted to be seen, and how it needs to be done. He argued that you know, we need to move that label and show New Zealanders that we're not just refugees but New Zealanders who contribute to this country. For Abar, these projects were about creating space in the resettlement sector for former refugee voices and empowering resettled communities to stand up and speak out and be heard and counted. Because he argued people from non-refugee backgrounds, although well-meaning, tend to dominate the discussion and speak on behalf of refugees, which is not only disempowering, but also very frustrating for resettled communities. This sentiment was actually echoed by John, um, who I quote, who was very negative about the word refugee, um, the quote I shared earlier. Um, he said that when he saw people talking about refugees, it made them feel funny because they talk about something they don't understand. They've not lived that experience. Let the refugee talk for themselves, not just let other people define who they are. And so this was quite a common theme around the people that I, I was interviewing. You know, other, other uh, people were also sick and tired of hearing non-refugees speak about the refugee experience and felt there was a need to take back control of that narrative for themselves. Many felt that publicly sharing their personal stories was a way to break down um, those stereotypes. And some actions um, that the participants took were creating a YouTube series about resettled youth growing up in New Zealand. Um, one other person did a TED talk um, and also did other community speaking engagements, and others wrote opinion pieces for newspapers. Um, but just going back to Sakina, who the one who really strongly identified with her refugee identity, um, she wanted to reclaim the story um, through her own voice by publicly sharing her experience in an art exhibition. So this um, exhibition was part of her final year project for a visual arts degree. Um, and she created a short film about her family's refugee journey 
Um, sorry, I should probably explain. Sakina was one of the Tampa refugees. So she came to New Zealand with her family as a very young child. She was five um, when the Tampa incident happened. And so she, what she wanted to do was um, she wanted to screen her story inside a shipping container to, to give the public um, and a, kind of give the effect of what it would have been like, perhaps, to have been on the Tampa and sheltering in these cargo containers while, you know, uh, it was going back and forth between the Tampa and the Australian government. Um, so she used, she used, her video used media coverage of the Tampa affair, um, over, uh, sorry, which was overlaid by her voice, narrating her experience, and there's just a, um, a still from her video here, which shows Sakina, she's basically flicking through these news articles um, from from New Zealand newspapers, but also Australian new, newspapers. Um, so it's media coverage of the Tampa incident at the time, and she's telling her own personal story of what it was like um, while she's flicking through those images. Um, so she said that telling her story through photographs and through video, she hoped to change people's views about these people and those refugees. Um, in a different way from the media coverage most people would have seen, because she, as she said, as soon as you type Tampa refugees into Google, you only get specific images as told by the media. So Sakina really wanted to highlight that everyone has their unique story and you won't know unless you actually talk to them and discover what their life has been like. To simply find out about their experiences really gives you something to think about. And that's what she was trying to achieve here with this installation. So these stories of contesting and redefining refugee illustrate the various ways in which the refugee background people are interviewed um, chose to take back control of those stereotypes um, surrounding the refugee label. They decided to be active agents of change within their own lives, aiming to transform the negative into the positive through stories, words, art and action. As Foucault argues, Although knowledge systems have the ability to construct powerful representations of the truth, it does not mean that one is doomed to an inescapable form of domination. Meaning is not infinitely fixed. In this respect, refugees may be labelled and shaped by discursive practices, but they are also capable of restructuring those practices, using their agency to dispute and transform stereotypes and contest their identities. And as Mohammed said to me here, if there is a definition, I define it. Thank you very much, he said. So just as a way to conclude, so the refugee welcome solidarity campaigns that happened in the media, although they were overwhelmingly very positive and, and uh, the, the representation of the crisis was overwhelmingly positive in terms of um, what New Zealand should do in terms of raising the quota, um, and there is a potential there to create a platform for pos positive political change, you know, to address social inequalities and injustices surrounding forced migration. Um, recent research done in Germany around the refugees' welcome movements um, really did say that, that people were politically transformed, that they may have started off um, from, a, from a place of charity, but actually... Uh, the art, act of actually volunteering with refugees and finding out what was happening in terms of the bureaucracy around claiming asylum and the fact that refugees um, were, didn't have access to certain resources, it really politicised people into uh, learning more about refugee rights and lack of rights. And so there is that potential there, but however, a word of caution, <laughs> There needs to be self reactivity in practice also. You know, people who are advocating on behalf of refugees need to be mindful of the kind of discourses and language and photos that they're using to convey their message and of, of you know, intentionally or unintentionally reproducing those stereotypes. Most importantly, though, refugees and former refugees need to be included in this discussion. You know, they, you know refugee advocates need to work collaboratively with refugees and former refugees. Um, and I know I didn't really go into this here, the interviews I had with refugee advocates here in New Zealand, um, they actually were very aware of the stereotypes and were trying to avoid the stereotypes 
Um, some, some are more aware of it than others, some really weren't aware of it at all, but I think there is um, awareness around that, which I think is quite positive as well. But there does need to be more stories told from the perspective of refugees and former refugees, um, rather than from the perspective of governments, humanitarian agencies and advocates. You know, personal narratives give voice to the individual experiences of seeking asylum and help receiving societies to understand the complexities of forced migration and what it means to be a refugee. And I'll just leave it there, I think. Um, thank you. <laughs> and any questions? <laughs> Thanks very much, Natalie. That was a really interesting talk. Um, I've scribbled notes seriously and probably have quite a lot of questions, but I will open it up first to see if there's questions amongst the audience. I can see we have about 14 screens, but I can see only four, so you'll have to please uh, raise a hand or shout and <laughs> make yourself known. Um, Natalie, if you just stop sharing the screen, all the um, everyone should come up. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Oh yeah, oh. look at that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's Francis. <laughs> yes. Look at that. Okay. Any questions for Natalie? Um, can I? Yeah. Yeah, it's not really a question, but some sort of a um, comment to the discussion. Um, I want to thank Natal Natalie, right? Yeah, for, I mean, the work you're doing, I think you did something differently. Um, your research was more for speaking from the point of view of um, the refugees, the migrants themselves. So once I was in Denmark and I met this guy who studied IT and after about five years he said to do migration studies. So um, I was curious as to why he had to make that disciplinary shift. So um, he says something from the media, from the NGOs, from the politicians, and also from the academia. He kept getting a definition of refugee that doesn't address him. So he felt he needed to go into the academia to try to redefine or reconceptualize the idea of refugee. So um, I would have loved to say that you tend to shift the blame toward the politicians the NGOs and the, the media. But I also think uh, the definition of refugees is also coming from the academia. Actually, the politicians and the media get the feelings from the academia and not the other way around. It's not as if the politicians and the media tell us what we do. But the research we do, the way we conceptualize refugees, the way we talk about migration, fits into the media and the, the politicians. So I would think you has not read the academia and made us angels. But anyway, it was a nice presentation. Thank you. And uh, yeah, doing what uh, Francis Collins uh, did, migration as a desire as a theory for migration. I, I would see that if we if we adopt that theory, then we'll be able to talk about migration, refugee, from the point of view of. Um, the subjects, the individuals who are undergoing these experiences. Oftentimes what we do is either we, we fall into the problem of uh, methodological nationalism, talking about these uh, subjects from the point of view of the receiving nation or from the point of view of the sending nation. Uh, much research has not really focused on the, the individuals undergoing this experience. But I think that's what you tried to do. And I think from that point of view, you did a nice work. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for your comment. Um, I think it's one of my ethical dilemmas in many ways is I'm part of the academic establishment and okay. so I'm, I guess, you know, you get to be seen as an expert on a certain topic eventually and that is part of the problem as well, experts speaking on behalf of others who are more than capable of speaking for themselves. Um, and you know, in writing up my research, you know, I'm going to have quite a big section about ethics in my methodology section and positionality, talking about that very thing that you were talking about, because I think it is a problem. But, you know, and, and often, you know, academics are interviewed for media because they're seen as being 
you know, experts in their field. Um, yeah. And so the media have, I come from the media as well, so having worked in the media, oh, I am yeah. well aware that everyone has a go-to person that they go to for certain topics. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that is part of the problem too. Um, you know, the word refugee, as much as it's a legal term, it's also very much a socially constructed term as well that can mean so many different things to different people and, and you know, has been used um, to stereotype um, negatively but also, you know, with well-intentioned meaning as well, which um, is a problem. So, yeah, thank you for your comments. You're welcome. Asima. Hi. Um, thank you for that, Natalie. It was a really good um, talk. Just drawing on the previous comment, um, I was just going to ask, did, can, it's understandable that a lot of your participants um, didn't identify with the, the label or the term refugee. And mm -hmm. was there anything that they said they'd rather be called? Because I saw the, um, the images, the public images that said from refugees to Kiwis or whatever it was. And I assume that's not them themselves Kiwis either, but did they say anything about what they would prefer to be called? Migrants maybe? or Because even the term former refugee um, is kind of re-establishing that label, I wonder? Yeah, um, more, more so, no, not refugee, not, not migrant, not a newcomer, not settled person, more I'm an Iranian Kiwi or I'm a Kiwi from an Iranian background or I'm, you know, um, I'm um, I'm a Saudi person, I'm not Saudi, I'm a, from Sudan, but I'm also a New Zealander. Most people did, did say I am a New Zealander because most of the people I spoke to had been here long enough to have gained citizenship. Um, and so for them very much, they saw themselves as being New Zealanders. New Zealanders from, you know, a particular ethnic background, but New Zealanders nonetheless. But what they did struggle with is that they felt that other New Zealanders didn't see them as being New Zealanders. Right. And so constantly, especially especially those people who, um, you know, from African country, because they were so physically different, they felt that people, you know, they'd be walking down the street and people would look at them sideways because trying to fit them, like, well, you, you don't, you're not familiar with me, I don't know where you come from, I don't know where you fit in here, you can't be a New Zealander because that's not what a New Zealander looks like, so where are you from? And so that question about where do you come from was a constant pain in the ass. <laughs> you know, where do you really the majority of the people I spoke to. Yeah, 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 no, yeah, that's great, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, yes. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hopefully, I'll go ahead and ask my question. Um, just a, a comment and a question. Um, first of all, I've been doing some um, interviews with Cambodians who came out to New Zealand, and they're actually more positive towards that label of refugees. They identify with it, so it'll be interesting just to see how this um, develops over time. Um, my question goes back to your term crisis that you used at the start oh, of your yeah, talk yeah. and we had um, Professor Alison Fitz here from Glasgow um, yeah. late last year and she referred to it as a hospitality crisis and I just wondered yeah. whether you might be able to comment on that where you're coming from in that perspective yeah um, yeah, I, I, I need to rethink that term crisis because again it is one that's been constructed by the media that it's not necessarily, I mean, I've heard people say it's not a refugee crisis, it's a crisis of resettlement or it's a crisis of hospitality, as Alison Fitz puts it. Um, but that word crisis itself is problematic in many ways because crisis denotes that there is a start and a finish. You know, the crisis started at a particular time, but as all crises do, eventually they will end. And actually there is absolutely no, you know, um, in fact, you know, there are more and more people being displaced every day. And so... You know, the UNHCR figures have to constantly be updated by how many people are now officially displaced around the world. And I think it's up to something like 67 million people, whereas last year it was 65 million. So this idea of crisis, yeah, is, pro is problematic for many means. And, and I'm using it in a way that that's what the media use. Mm -hmm. But when I say so-called European refugee crisis, it's like that's something that, well, Europe doesn't have the refugee crisis. You know, um, there's hardly, you know, compared to places like Turkey and Jordan who are, and Pakistan mm -hmm. who are hosting, you know, infinitely more refugees than Europe will ever 
um, it's not really a crisis in those terms. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Natalie. Yeah, um, so um, I think I like the idea of a crisis of hospitality. And it's a new term. I'm not very versed in refugee studies and the, the theories about refugee studies. Uh, but, but I would think what is happening in Europe and in most countries, maybe also in New Zealand, is that uh, our politicians have failed to conceptualize in a proper way the grounds for accepting refugees. It's as if we do that on the basis of the big brother or um, saving humanity or being generous or being hospitable, you know, the crisis of hospitality. But, but I would think if we construct some theory against what John Ross would call the criterion of reciprocity. So in the sense that we do something based on a veil of ignorance that we do not know if this event could happen to us. So we do it not because we're a big brother, but on the criterion of reciprocity. So uh, Europe is feeling they're into a refugee crisis because they imagine that in the next 100 years, nothing is going to befall Europe. No way is going to happen in Europe. But when we adopt that concept of the criterion of reciprocity, then we do things, we attend to refugees on the belief that somehow, someday, it's possible things could turn around. Of course, when you, see, when you speak to a Syrian refugee, seven, eight, nine years ago, they never believed that uh, Syria is going to be in this kind of mess. Syria was flourishing. It was like um, ascending the, the HDI index and everything. Um, but things have just turned around. And it could happen to any country. So we begin to reframe and uh, reconceptualize the discourse about refugees, accepting migrants on the basis of the criteria of reciprocity. I would think we'll make a, a headway rather than on the grounds of big brother, hospitality, uh, humanitarianism, and stuff like that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks. That's an interesting comment. Thank you. Can I just say something? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I really appreciate you, what you um, talked about uh, in terms of kind of uh, deconstruction of how we are defining refugee. And I myself think that the main problem is that as long as we who hold kind of some sort of power as either, that doesn't matter, as academics, as like media or politician, um, we cannot, I mean, as long as we, we try to define something which is not us, uh, the definition is not the right definition. The, the, we are always like othering to, to actually define ourselves. So we want to distinguish ourselves from the, the other thing. So that colonization happened there. So when we were talking about uh, the media discourse and the humanitarian discourse, and they both fail to define the right thing as they are because of that colonization of compassion in, other, in any sense. Uh, so that, then we have that a failure in defining and that defi definition must be done by the by those people themselves and that that's why we need more of those people in everywhere in academia in, in power in uh, media to define themselves and then that that right definition would, would lead to the right decision making for the distribution of uh, services and resources for these kind of people uh, that was one comment and the other thing i was wondering is is that have you, in, in, in interviewing the um, individuals with refugee background, have you considered that in their discourses of defining themselves, uh, have you felt that there is something that you could say that their discourses is influenced by that mainstream discourse as well? Um, yeah, in so much as they're contesting that mainstream discourse, um, and so they feel like they're being defined by others um, mm -hmm. in a way that they don't necessarily want to be defined by. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, they are influenced by that. Um, but in terms of, yeah, that word refugee, I mean, for those who really embrace their right refugee identity, are they being, yeah, influenced? I don't, I don't know. I don't think they necessarily, I mean, I think, it would, yeah, yeah, it'd be hard not to be influenced by the mainstream discourses because it's everywhere. 
um, and they've gone through the whole institutionalization of coming a refugee and, and receiving that refugee status. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to know those that embrace their refugee identity whether they've been influenced by those mainstream discourses. But it, um, but I think definitely the ones who are rejecting it or are contesting it are definitely because they're reacting to that mainstream discourse and saying no, that's not right, and I don't agree with it. Uh, were these refugees like refugees from the like were they newcomer refugees or uh, were they like second generation, one and a half generation refugees? Um, a real mixture. So, um, so some some had, but most of them had been in New Zealand for quite a number of years. Um, some had grown up here in New Zealand, like had come as children. Um, others had been in New Zealand for you know two, three years. So, relatively new. They were, you know, they hadn't yet gained their citizenship. Um, um, uh, some were second generation. There was a couple of people who were children of of parents who who had come in as refugees. Um, so yeah, a real range, a real mixture. Thank you. Can I um, jump in? Uh, Natalie, um, yeah. thanks for the really good um, presentation. I missed the first part of it, I'm sorry. Um, I just, I just I'm wondering, kind of following up on some of the questions, that have been, whether there were, um, and you might have covered this earlier when I wasn't here, but whether there were particular moments where um, the, the encounter with the term refugee was amplified or stronger. Um, and I asked that, ask that question in particular thinking about um, there, are, there are certain engagements with institutions where those institutions may see having people of refugee background as uh, valuable in a funding sense. I'm thinking schools, oh, yeah. funding. I'm thinking healthcare providers in terms of, you know, in terms of the provision of support for specialised services. I'm thinking universities with their targeted admission schemes. All of these hinge on a claim about what is a refugee and then, and then, and then yeah. targeted around that. Did that emerge in the kinds of accounts that people had of, you know, being labelled a refugee? And, I, you know, it's, that then... <laughs> It sort of raises some tensions around this because the, the meaning of the term refugee become you know is entrenched there, but it's also be, those are systems for general, well, at least that seek to generate you know uh, better equity outcomes. So yeah, any sort of response to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that came out quite a few times as different people I spoke to. People really um, those who were trying, like for instance, the ARCC who were trying to work really hard to redefine the word refugee and get a move away from the word refugee express their frustration that when they then have to apply for funding from the government, it's insert refugee word here in order to get that funding. So for them, that was a bit of a catch-22. It's like they need the funding because they're a grassroots organisation with very little money. Um, you know, they have since explored other avenues of funding um, from like the Tyndall Foundation and, and others. But, but yeah, they did that, especially for government funding. And when they were dealing with government organisations, you're trying to not use that word refugee, they found really, really hard. Other people I spoke to were very critical of, of people who use the word refugee in order to get like scholarships or, you know, um, like John, who I interviewed, who was, um, I don't know, sorry, I don't know when you came in, but he was very, very negative about um, being defined as a refugee. He didn't want anything to do with that word. And he was also very... Um, very negative or looked down on, on other people from refugee backgrounds who did choose to use that word refugee. And he was particularly critical of Gol Rizgarman, who's the Green, one of the Green MP. He was like, <coughs> what's she doing using that word refugee? She's not a refugee anymore, you know, she's been in this country for years. So why would she, and, and, and so for him, him seeing that, he felt like she was using that word in order to gain political, yeah. a political space. And he felt that was wrong. Whereas others are like, well, yeah, I mean, it is a bit of a catch-22 and it's a bit of a paradox, but, you know, why not? Why can't we use that word refugee if it can get us extra resources or, you know, they're kind of using their agency in that way. Like, I may not personally identify with it, but actually in order to get funding or to get the scholarship or to get the health services, why not? If I can, I'm from a refugee background, if I can use it, the funding's there, why not? And I kind of agree with them. I'm like, well, why not? Yeah, I mean, um, so yeah, it was interesting. Interesting the way that word refugee has been institutionalised and how it's been used um, in order to gain something 
but at the same time, people are trying to change the narrative and contest the narrative as well. Yeah, it makes it, it makes it very complicated. I mean, as you were saying that, I was thinking in particular of the uh, you mentioned scholarships a few times. Thinking of the Bob Jones scholarships yeah. targeted specifically yeah. to woman, young women of refugee backgrounds, which is caught up in a in what what I take to be Bob Jones's view of all refugees as as being you know discriminatory towards women, and so I'm going to target my efforts there. Um, yeah, you know. <sighs> So things get really, really, really complicated then in the constitution of what it, what is refugee and you know, uh, yeah. yeah, interaction with funding and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I know Auckland University has also started up a scholarship for refugee background youth, um, and that was heavily um, Rhys Gardy was heavily involved in setting that up. And she, I don't know if anyone knows who Rhys Gardy is, but she was the um, Young New Zealander of the Year um, last year or the year before. I can't remember. Um, she's um, she's a she was she came here as a child. She's from a Kurdish background, um, but she's very very strong on um, just being very vocal about the word refugee. And she said to herself, she had this internal struggle about whether to when she was setting the scholarship up whether to use the term refugee because a lot of refugee background youth don't want to be described as refugees because they feel like people look at them in a different way or treat them differently, and they don't want to be treated differently. They just want to be treated like any other Kiwi. Um, so yeah, there is that, that internal struggle at times, I think, too. Any other questions? No? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I might add, uh, we have a little bit of time left. I might just add one question. It's, it's a really interesting <laughs> um, topic, <laughs> Natalie. Um, one thing that struck me, because you were also talking about the sort of contribution narrative as something that would contribute to painting a fuller picture maybe of, of the person. And it sounded like uh, people of refugee background you interviewed were also um, sort of in favor or you know advocating that sort of narrative um, what what's your thoughts on this because I find it a little bit um, problematic as well it's another discourse next to the sort of victimhood discourse I remember there was a publication in Australia a while back that portrayed people of refugee background and all the contributions they had made to society and I always feel it's it puts like the onus on those people to to be you know um, contributing members of society that it puts like an extra burden it seems uh, on yeah them. yeah definitely I mean like in, in, the, in the media that I analysed, there was lots of, you know, the contributions refugees make to society, you know, the economic contributions, the cultural contributions, um, you know, um, and are almost positions like if refugees aren't they're doing these amazing, wonderful things, then perhaps are they not as worthy of being resettled as others kind of thing? And it does set up that problematic um, rhetoric. And, and I think... Yeah, in Australia, I know, I know that the discourses you're talking about in Australia, and um, there's a lot of like, I am, a, I am an Australian or I am a boat person. I don't know if you've seen that, and it's basically like there's a neurosurgeon, and there's all these really amazing people who've done amazing things in Australia who happen to have come from, um, who happen to have come to Australia as asylum seeker. And it's trying to change that narrative around not all asylum seekers are poor, illiterate, unskilled, you know. Um, but then again, not everyone's going to be a neuroscientist or a you know, a surgeon or an architect or, a, you know, and a politician. Um, but does that matter? I mean, surely the point is that people are people and are human beings and deserve, um, you know, to be resettled regardless of the kind of skills that they may or may not bring to New Zealand. Um, but I think what people were getting at in terms of showing the full story was not so much about what they are contributing to society or have contributed to society, but more, you know, what were they what were they doing in their in their home country before war broke out, before they had to flee? Like, you know, um, what kind of profession did they do? Or, you know, um, what was their family life like? Or where were they living? And and yeah, okay, they went through this terrible experience. Um, although not everyone who flees um, has necessarily gone through a traumatic experience necessarily. So this idea that 
again, that trauma narrative is problematic because it positions that all refugees as being traumatised, and that's not necessarily true. But then what, what are they doing here in New Zealand? Like, how is their life going here? What are they doing? You know, um, how are they settling in? What do they like about New Zealand? What are they missing from back home? Just kind of providing us full picture of, of their life rather than just this terrible thing happened to them and they're traumatised and that's all they become is this traumatised person. You know, so I think that's what they were mainly getting at. And the Red Cross have actually tried to really, um, they've been doing a lot of work around trying to provide that full story. I know the Dominion Post particularly did a whole series of, of um, feature-length stories on some of the Syrian families that had been settled in Wellington and had kind of done it like a few months after they arrived, six months later, then a year later. So they had done these kind of follow-up stories about, well, where are they up to now? How are they finding life here in Wellington? And, and that sort of thing. And I think that's the kind of um, full story that uh, some of the participants I spoke to were trying to get at. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. You mentioned Riz Gardi, who was here for the Pathways Conference last year, and I think she spoke yeah. about that in exactly those terms of uh, people's fear sometimes as well in speaking to some to a person with a refugee background because that comes to dominate <laughs> their identity. Yeah. Rather than yeah. Story. Yeah. Actually, just as a side, since we're just talking about Riz, she'd tell me this really interesting story about this refugee youth forum she attended um, at the UN. And she felt that she wasn't refugee enough to be this. There was almost this kind of competitive nature about, you know, um, your what kind of story you had, and and this people who had, you know, worse stories were more refugee than her who arrived as a child and grew up in New Zealand. And you know, she kind of felt like she almost didn't feel like she could use that term refugee to describe herself because she wasn't refugee enough. So within you know refugee background communities, there's this kind of real friction around that word refugee and who's allowed to use it and who's not. It's quite interesting. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I think generally there's some really interesting connections and generally talking about or thinking about migration policy and border politics, right, and how we manage migration and what kind of discourses we use to allow people in <laughs> to just yeah yeah because the contribution is quite similar to other migration discourses so. yeah because i mean you know um even though new zealand has this refugee quota system um you know it is it is and it is largely humanitarian um there is also a lot of emphasis on you know economic contributions and being able to integrate as quickly as possible so refugees are chosen for the resettlement program based on, you know, not just the humanitarian needs, how well they're going to fit into New Zealand, how are they going to integrate. Um, I mean, there is also a number of women at risk categories, um, or people who come in on the women at risk category, also people with disabilities and health issues that are, that are resettled. So, I mean, there is there are humanitarian, obviously, largely humanitarian elements to the program, but there's also this kind of underlying um, how are they going to be useful for uh, New Zealand <laughs> in a way as well. Yes. Okay. 